Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here, for celebrating the wonderful mission and vision and the work we do as part of the Smart Reading Program. I love it that you're here. This annual celebration warms my heart, and it's uh, our ability, our opportunity, rather, to salute you and thank you for your time, your talent, your treasure, the many ways that you give to make SMART strong and vital. I'm Holly Stork. I'm your area manager um, for Klamath and Lake Counties, where we do our very best to serve every city, county, and school, preschool, school and preschool, um, which is a, a noble task. There is no other area in the state that serves all city and county preschools. Most of the bigger regions only serve the Title I programs. So it's something that's a badge of honor we wear with great pride. And that was um, an initiative long ago, in fact, 25 years ago, when Dick Wendt, the founder of Joe Wendt, the governor at the time came down and asked Dick, and it would take writing a, a large check but um, in doing so, there was a lot of research that Dick did behind that, and he learned that he wanted to serve far more than Title I schools. He wanted to make sure that it was need blind, that every school had the same access to the reading and the early literacy initiatives. And so he wanted us to, with his initial gift that served the entire state of Oregon, he and his lovely wife, Nancy, that gift, his dictate in that was that we would serve long and broad and deep, and that his gift would initiate many gifts to come and many readers, and that we would foster a love of literacy and supporting the schools through our work. And so we're very proud to carry on Dick's legacy, and we're thankful that he um, had the foresight and the love of the program and understood the great need to be able to do that for us. So that was 25 years ago and we're, we're here and we're strong and... <laughs> it's no secret that it's because of you. Because without you, the lifeblood of our organization, the readers who suit up and show up every week for those little faces who are so excited to have you mentor them, to visit with them, to discuss storylines and books and characters, or maybe none of that. Maybe they just want to talk about their life and what they're thinking or feeling that day. Thank you for being the people you are with the hearts that you have. We're so grateful to you. We've got an exciting slate of people here tonight who are jumping out of their seats to want to thank you too for all that you do. So um, I would like to first welcome Karen Lynch Went. Her, she is also a sponsor of this event tonight. We thought it um, fitting. Her store is Poppy downstairs, uh, downtown, downstairs, downtown. And we thought, gosh, celebrating spring, even though it might be hailing outside, we're going to have a hail of a good time in here with the with the balloons and the bright bright night. So, uh, Karen, if you'd like to come up and give our welcome, that would be terrific. Good evening. My name is Karen Lynch, and this precious child is my granddaughter. Mariana Armijo. She is in kindergarten at Roosevelt, so she is an early reader, and she is there with her um, sister and brother, and uh, so she she blessed me by being here with me this evening to have spaghetti. <laughs> so um, I'm happy to be here to welcome you to such an important event, and. Um, I have been involved in the SMART program in its early um, years. I was an avid reader at Pelican School when my children attended. Um, and um, I have been a school sponsor and I believe strongly um, we have a, a family heritage of, um, of this belief in early literacy and its importance to um, all children and their abilities to succeed in, in the world. So Holly invited me to help sponsor this event, knowing my commitment to, sport, to SMART, and, um, and also because Holly has this way of tying everything in, and our store is named Poppy. So <laughs> Holly thought that that was appropriate um, and ties in with your spring theme. So I welcome you tonight, and I recognize some people here. It's been a long time, as I said, I read many years ago. Um, but when Pellet, Holly's written these wonderful notes for me to remind me of my past, 
She said, I, I helped on the kitchen crew, which I did. I'm a great chili server. And, and we were able, myself and some others, were able to, um, to sponsor a whole school at, at Pelican at a time when, when we were shorthanded in that area. And so um, I'd like to think that, um, that that made a difference. I loved reading for SMART. I just loved it. There is nothing more fulfilling um, than to be there and, and listen to children share their lives with you. So I want to thank you for valuing education, embracing early literacy, and showing up for kids week after week after week. So please enjoy this evening, and um, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Karen, for your generous sponsorship and enduring support. Sharon, Karen is somebody that I can go to when I want to think big and dream big and come up with ideas. She's a great thinker, and so I, I really have an allegiance and appreciate that in our friendship as well. We have with us tonight John Rodemaker. John is with, um, he's a retired principal. He is an active, smart volunteer. He and his wife have now stepped up and led the Chiloquin program as the site coordinators, along with a, a Sandy, um, another colleague as well. Thank you, Sandy. This year, when our beloved coordinator of many, many years, her, her spouse passed away. And so they stepped up with extraordinary, extraordinary energy and enthusiasm, continuing that program. Our program at Chiloquin is really a flagship program, and it's very strong. They serve every child in every grade. And so it is a huge task to do um, and when every grade excuse me up through third grade and so they serve them two days a week some of the kids even get double dosing it's a program we're very proud of but in terms of operations it's a huge endeavor and so i think he offers a really rich and wonderful perspective having been a principal a site coordinator and a friend and fan and loyal smart reader for so many years so please welcome john rodemaker that, that's Holly's story, is why she invited me, because I've done quite a few different things. Uh, I started out with the smart reading program as principal up at Chiloquin, and got to read to a kindergarten kid who's now in 11th grade and a successful reader. Um, I also have been a volunteer since then, and this year, as she mentioned, we got to step up and be the coordinators. Uh, the other option of why I got asked to speak if you ask my wife, it's because I got a loud mouth. Um, I, do we have do we have students in here that that are benefits from the Smart Reader past or present? How many how many people? Raise your hands if you've been a student in the Smart Reading program. Nobody from Hamley out there. All right, good to see you. Football players that were smart smart cats. Great, great. Uh, how many volunteer readers? Raise your hands. Raise your if you're a volunteer reader. Um, Coordinators, site coordinators, please stand up, please. I've learned that this year, I've learned some great respect for site coordinators. Thank you. And how, how about administrators? Are there any administrators here tonight? I know Dr. Hilliard came a couple of years ago, and uh, that was nice to see that he was supporting. We do have an administrator. Oh, hey. <laughs> So why do we smart read? I guess the importance of smart reading is linked to the importance of reading, which is linked to the importance of learning, which is in linked to the importance of education, which gives all people the opportunity for the expansion of their lives, whether it's through careers or just personal novel reading, the, 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 uh, how neat it is to read and, and get your mind off of anything you want because you can go to a new place, um, whether it's the garden that we have at our table or uh, whatever, it, it, you know, the quality of life, your careers, all that is so many, I, I don't care what they do with computers and talking phones or anything else, you must learn to read, and even a few years ago, I was working with a kindergarten teacher, 
And after her lesson, she asked all the kids in the class why it was so important to learn the alphabet and learn to read. And one kid raised his hand and said, so we can learn to text. And I thought, well, there we go. It, it is a new world. So, but it, I, honestly, I really want to thank your volunteer efforts. I know it's time. I know sometimes you feel like, oh, geez, I got other things to do. But uh, you folks are the ones that make this work for our kids. And that, that's a good thing. Thank you. One of the things that sets us apart, and I think all of you know this, but it's something pretty extraordinary, we give books away every month for kids to, to keep as their very own and have their own literacy library. I see many of our readers all through here, but in particular some of our, our young readers from high schools who weren't even aware that that was a component of what we do until they started reading. And so there's many programs like us, but certainly not as good or as strong as us. In having to give away books, or wanting to give away books rather, it's an expensive endeavor for sure. We also want to make sure that we perform extensive background checks on the people who we put in the lives of children so that we make sure that we are making good decisions and that they are safe, responsible adults that we are placing in their lives. So those things are costly. And so as much as we love the, noble, the nobility and the excitement and the honor of reading with these kids, there is a dollars and cents, there's a price tag attached to us. And we have people in our community who have recognized that who truly believe in all the good that the many organizations, our partner organizations that we lock arms with, and they are, they are long and storied and very, very worthy as well. But in particular, there's a group called the Benefit for the Basin. Please raise your hand if you've heard of this terrific organization. They live and breathe to figure out ways in which to support nonprofits. They spend an entire year fundraising in order to be able to give it away to worthy causes that have earned their respect, their attention, and their admiration. The head of this organization and a tireless advocate is Keith Stotts with Benefit for the Basin. And I'd like Keith to come up and share a few words about why he and his group thought that SMART was in fact important to earn their, their dollars and their respect. Thank you, Holly. So my name is Keith Stotts. I happen to be the <clears throat> co-chair, actually, of uh, Benefit for the Basin. We're uh, an organization that uh, came about about four years ago, and actually one of the founders of it, we uh, just had his service on Friday, Archie Lindman, the owner of Cloud-Based Equipment, uh, unfortunately passed away recently. He uh, came actually to me four years ago and said, hey, can we put an organization together? We restore some old cars, we sell raffle tickets, and we hold an event in September, generate quite a bit of money to put back into youth and youth education in the community. Um, in doing that, um, Ray Holiday contacted me three years ago and said, you know, what do you know about the SMART program? And I said, well, I know quite a bit. You know, I've lived here 30 years. And he said, would your organization like to be involved in it? I said, absolutely. It's a no-brainer for us. We want to support it in any and every way. So we jumped on board with them uh, with a sponsorship, um, something that just transpired here a month or so ago. We were down in, in uh, Doris. The SMART program put on a, a fundraiser there, and we went down as a group and contributed to it again. <clears throat> Furthermore, I, I guess I really want to let everybody know here, uh, I come from a family of long education. My wife happens to be a school teacher in the community, a kindergarten teacher here. Uh, she's been in the grade school teaching. In living with somebody like that, obviously we know how important uh, reading and literacy is. And, and I have an elderly gentleman here in the community that actually told me probably 20 years ago when his grandson graduated from Bonanza and told him, you know, uh, Adam, if you, if you can't read, you're not going to be able to go very far in life. Well, that young man happens to be a school teacher over in uh, North Medford now. He was in Coos Bay for quite a few years after he graduated from college and has done very well for himself. And every time Adam comes back for a family function, I try to get around and, and visit with him. Every, every time he comes back, he always tells me about how important what his grandfather told him that you need to learn to read. So in saying all that, I do know a lot of people in this community that uh, have contributed to the SMART program as far as donating their time, like Holly was saying, that go out there and, and, and uh, read at, at the most all of it that I'm aware of is the elementary level and stuff for these young children. So Benefit for the Basin is on board. We finished our fourth year up. Um, we've committed... Uh, every one of our partnerships that we
do with these people. They know that we're going to be here as long as the community supports our organization. So um, we're here. Uh, we, we know how important the SMART program is, and we're going to continue to financially support it in any way that we can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. Keith was referring to our Boots for Books Bash, which is our kickoff to the school year. This year, mark your calendars. It's already on um, schedule for Saturday, September 16th. It's a hooting and hollering, wear your boots and your belt buckles and your cowboy hats and come dance and romance and kick your heels up and have fun and a, a beer or two. And uh, we have paddle raises for book packs that supplement our kids that we give away the books. And it's a special treat, so keep that, that in mind. Thank you, Keith. Well, you can already tell by some of the people who have given you to hoots and salutes that it's a team. It's a team approach. It's not just readers, and it's not just community leaders, and it's not just donors. It's all the people behind the scenes, and um, we're a team. We are, in fact, a family. And so one of the people I would like to um, introduce right now is somebody who has, knows a lot about teams, and he has committed himself to um, a big team, to the Henley football team. Alex Stork was a site coordinator. Oh, there. Yeah, you guys. I like that. Alex was um, a site coordinator for his senior project at Roosevelt Elementary School. That senior project was a campaign. There's some posters along the walls. He developed, he was very disappointed when he saw that so few gentlemen, men were reading. And he said, gosh, we gotta get some men in the lives of these little people. So before the season started or the reading session, he wrote to his pastor and his church and his dad's colleagues at Geldwin, some community leaders. And he said, I need you. And he grew three men that were reading in that program to 125 men reading for the school that year. In fact, it earned him the um, Prudential Spirit of Community Award in Washington, D.C., and he got to meet El, um, Eli Manning. Eli Manning. So here is Alex reading with his reader. His name was Toshome, and um, we're very excited because I think he has a really rich perspective on not only the SPARK program because of his heartstrings, but how he looks at it through a lens of team and how we are all a fabric of a, of a team and a family, Team Smart. And so I'm going to invite Alex up here to give you uh, his perspective as well. Thanks. Never an introduction like the one your mom gives you. I'm <laughs> um, sorry, I just get so constrained behind these things. I um, feel so locked in. But I want to start by giving a big, big round of applause to Heidi and Carly and Chris for all their work back in the kitchen tonight, and Bernie and everyone else who put this thing together, you know, it looks so great. And so appreciative for everything they do. And I'd also just like to, once again, give a big round of applause to all the volunteers, site coordinators, um, area coordinators, supervisors here. Just a big round of applause for everybody involved in this wonderful organization. And uh, the big round of applause I'd like to give to somebody who never gets round of applause. She puts us on all these events, which are amazing. What she does in Klamath Falls for this program every year is just incredible. What she does for this program every year in Klamath Falls Unbelievable. The way she grows the district, the way she raises the funds for this program, just incredible. And that's my mom, Holly Short. <laughs> With my Henley football guys tonight because we haven't even played a game yet. I was just hired a few months ago. But I love these guys so much, and I'm having so much fun. So hopefully we'll win a couple games. But <laughs> along, the, along the way, we're going to have a great time and just loving the guys. I love everybody in this room because I love this organization. I love being a part of the Smart Reading Organization because I personally feel it is one of the most impactful organizations that I have ever got to spend time with and be a part of. I've been on plenty of athletic teams, a part of plenty of volunteer organizations, but Smart Reading is second to none in terms of impact on a community and impact on my life as a reader and volunteer. So the mission statement, you know, is about literacy development 
And it's so much more than that. For all of us in this room, we know this SMART is so much more than the literacy and the reading development. It's about the passion and the love for the relationships we build with these kids. It's just incredible. The best reading sessions I've ever had in SMART reading, bar none, I can tell you the best reading sessions I've ever had in SMART, we never read a word out of the book. <laughs> we sat there for 30 minutes talking about, I don't know what, about what mascots they liked or what their favorite color was or what they were going over in school. And they're like, oh yeah, we should read. But when I first started reading, that wasn't the case at all. When I first started reading, it was, you know, you show up, oh gosh, mom's reading me, go to this reading program again. <laughs> all right, what books did you go get your books? Yeah. Go get your books. So he brings the books over, then you just read through the books, and then you know you send them along the way, and then the next reader comes along. But when I finally understood that there's a soul and a heart and a brain and so much more there when they're sitting next to you and reading with you, that's when I was like, wow, this organization is so cool. It's so amazing to be a part of, and I'm so blessed to be a part of it. I actually do need these. So it kind of come full circle with the real uh, Men Read program that we did at Roosevelt for my senior project. For my senior capstone project at Southern Oregon, I did a real Raiders Read program. So what real Raiders Read is, is we take student athletes from SOU and we pair them up with community elementary age students. So all the elementary age students in the community, we were only able to serve about 25 um, these past couple of years, but it's still so much fun to be a part of. And, and the primary um, portion, primarily, of the students was uh, English language learners. So how cool was it to be able to pair up these English language learning students with these African American, these Hispanic athletes at SOU? Just so cool to have them look up to these guys and build these relationships. And like I said before, not a whole lot of reading was done all the time, but we had some fun. There was a lot of recesses involved instead of uh, reading, because that was more fun for us, too. No wonder but, we're national champions. Yes, and yeah, we did win a national championship. That was pretty cool, too. <laughs> but like I was saying before, the reason I started this Real Raiders Read program was because I was working a practicum setting, and... I was in the school and, you know, cell phones, technology, everything else, and the kids go, you know, why don't you guys read anymore? Why don't, why don't students read as much anymore? They're like, reading, man. Reading isn't cool. Reading isn't the hip thing to do anymore. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Reading is so cool. And that's why tonight I was thinking, because I love acronyms about as much as I love as much as my mom loves alliteration so <laughs> so for my Henley football program I started this lead philosophy and so I'm going to get this interview for Henley football and I'm like oh, okay got X's and O's X's and no I don't know any of that stuff I'm not that good at that stuff I'm just going to talk about what I know which is just loving the guys and and building character and building relationships with each other so my whole thing was about lead and what lead is is little things, effort, attitude, and discipline. Yes! <laughs> and that's what this whole program was built on. We're still building the foundation right now, still pouring the concrete, but it's coming. Just wait. Be ready this fall. Be ready this fall. Okay? So I thought of an acronym because I was thinking, what could be an acronym for smart readers? And I was thinking about that kid I was talking to, and I was like, bingo. Cool! Cool guys and gals of SMART. And here's what cool stands for. And the first quote that I wrote down tonight was a quote by C.S. Lewis um, out of one of his children's stories. And it was, a children's story that can only be enjoyed by children is a bad children's story. <laughs> you know, when you go to, <laughs> yeah, when we go to SMART, those books are so amazing. When some days, you know, I don't think I get the message as much as I should. But on the days when I'm really in tune, which I'm really working on, being there, being 100% present each time I'm in there, and leaving everything else behind me, those books are so cool and have so much meaning. And it's so much more than what the story is telling you. There's so much hidden messages in those stories, and they're so cool for everybody involved. So the first C in cool stands for courageous, because smart volunteers and smart reading students are courageous. Those kids are amazing. I can't tell you how many times 
I've been there, maybe the first couple times I started reading, and the kids are struggling, <coughs> struggling bad, and you can tell how much it hurts them to not be able to get the words out because they're so excited. The funny ones are the ones that'll read the story before, and then they'll <laughs> recite the words to you because they memorized it, and you're like, wait a second, go over each word as you go, follow along. You know, you don't actually know the words. So, you know, watch out for that when the next time you're reading with one of those new students. So, but courageous, courageous. These guys have the courage of lions. It's amazing to see how resilient they are because once you give them that book to take home, you better believe the next time you're with them, they're going to know how to read that book and they're going to have read it five times. They're going to go home, they're going to read to their little siblings, and they're going to read that book on their own before they go to bed because they're so proud of being a smart reader. Volunteers and readers, there's a great sense of pride in being a smart reader. And that leads me to the O. And we all know from being a part of this program how observant these students are. <laughs> we have to be there and present every time we go in there. If you're distant and not paying attention, well, little Johnny or little Susie, they're going to be distant and not paying attention either. They're going to be, oh, yeah. And they're, they're going to be asking you a question or pulling on your hair or doing whatever, messing with you. So you got, we got to be there when we're there because they're so observant. So we got to lead by example. So when we're there, we got to bring the energy. And my coach, Coach Howard, late great coach at SOU, just passed away a couple months ago, great mentor for me. He would always say, fake it till you make it. Fake the energy till you make it. Because when you fake it, when I fake it, I'm going to rub it off. I'm going to rub it off on somebody else. When I fake the energy, it's going to be contagious. And I'm going to rub it off on this person who's going to rub it off on everybody else. And it's so fun to be in a smart reading room where everybody's having a great time and loving reading and not being distracted and like, oh, can we get out of here already? Okay. So the next O, oh, and this one I was kind of playing with for a little bit, but optimistic. These guys and girls are so optimistic, and they have such big dreams and hopes, and it's so cool to help them get to where they want to be through our love of reading and their own love of reading. It's just, so, I can't go on enough how cool the program is, and how cool when you break through that wall, because you keep pounding it, you keep pounding it, you keep pounding it, and then finally, that aha moment comes, and you break through that wall, and it's such an incredible moment that if if you haven't experienced it yet, I encourage you to stick with the program because it is so worthwhile when you get there. It is so worthwhile when you get there. And the consistency, the consistency of being there is so important for these guys. I was just talking to somebody. It's just, if you're going to be there, be there every week and commit to these guys because they love it so much. The worst thing, you know, is when you're a site coordinator and you go, pick up your classroom and you get the 13 kids in the 25 person class and then the 12 other students are sitting there and they look so sad. They look so sad and you have to be like, oh God, well I'm going to go recruit 12 more volunteers, don't you worry. But that's not what's happening. But the worst is when you read to 12 students and you read to 12 students pretty much every week and then you go back the next week and you go to the classroom and you say, well I only got 10 volunteers today. And those two students that usually read don't get a read. So they're just, oh, that just breaks your, you know, tears the heartstrings out of you, pulls your heartstrings. So consistency and being there. And I'm preaching the choir. I know how important it is to everybody in here. But just being there each and every week is so important. Being there, building those relationships and breaking through. Um, and then uh, the last one, L in, in cool for cool guys and gals as smart as love. And that's what it's all about. This, this organization, there's a mission statement, and it's wonderful, but the mission statement I have for the program is building relationships of passion for reading through love. It's all about love, and that's my whole um, mantra for our, for our family football guys. It's so cheesy, and I know when I go to SOU, for our football camp this summer, they're going to laugh at me, but I don't care. Because on our practice jerseys, we printed the acronym, uh, Coaches Will Love Coaches. So CWLC, 
Coaches will love players, CWLP. Players will love coaches, and players will love players with their names on the back. Because that's what I'm all about. That's what this program's about. That's what everybody in this room is about. Yes. Is about love and loving these guys. And I'm so proud to be a part of this organization. I truly am. I truly am proud to be a part of this organization. So it's so great. It's so great. And I encourage us all because we're advocates and we have such a cool platform because we can go out in the community and say, you, you should be a smart reader. You should be a smart reader. And if your buddy wasn't a smart reading, don't say, oh, that's okay. Say, why weren't you there? Because little Jimmy was waiting for you there. Yeah. Little Jimmy was waiting for you there. So be there next time. And if you're going to be there Tuesday at 2 o'clock, be there Tuesday at 2 o'clock every day all year. Do what you can to be there because it's important. And I, I saw the Shel Silverstein quote from A Light in the Attic. And it was about love. And it was, how much good inside a day Depends how, so the quote says, how much good inside a day depends how good you live them. How much love inside a friend depends how much you give them. We got to love these guys. We got to love these guys. I know we all do. We got to continue to do so. And the last quote that I want to leave with, as I started with one, is a Dr. Seuss quote and just the power of literacy and reading, passion for reading where it can take you is more that you read the more things you will know the more that you learn the more places you'll go so thank you all for what you do i appreciate it thank you alex he's um a, an elementary education major so somebody's going to be very lucky to have him in their classroom and the smart reading program is lucky to have him as well and i know he's recruiting all you henley players to come help us out at henley so in order to have a base in a community that is responsible, that stays out of the court system, the juvenile justice system, that has people that suit up and show up for them in those kind of ways. One of the things that uh, Roxanne Osborne has shared with us is that the things that keep kids out of her, out of her courtroom when she was uh, a youth court, municipal court judge, she said was the kids who could read the kids who had those advantages and opportunities. They could also read to fill out a job application or their paperwork at school. And so we have such a wonderful family of friends in our law enforcement community. And we are beyond excited to have Chief Hensley and his beautiful family come and bring light and energy and contribute right off the bat to our community. He has a dynamic, uh, Chief David Hensley has a dynamic wife, Benji, who's just first class, three lovely daughters, and they rolled up their sleeves and came and dug in and figured out how can we help, how can we advance big dreams and ideas and, and really put in a lot of sweat equity in all sorts of capacities. And so I am thrilled and excited that um, Chief Hensley's here tonight to talk about how law enforcement and it partners with these kind of programs in such an extraordinary way. So welcome, please, Chief Hensley, and let him know how happy we are to have you. I think that's very cool, actually, to have me follow Alex. <laughs> <laughs> really, I, I was just going to get for a say, ditto. <laughs> Well, sit down. That was incredible. You're, you're a 10, Alex. Uh, okay. hope, hopefully my grandkids have you as a teacher someday. Gosh, I just had grandkids. Honey, you're only 16. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought I was going to come up and read today, and um, then I realized I was supposed to give a speech, so I've got nothing. And then I follow Alex on top of that, so I'm, I'm at a loss for what I'm going to talk about today. Um, but, no, really, I showed up for one reason today. Well, two, Holly, my daughter, asked, um, and i got to be a good dad. <laughs> but I wanted to say thank you. I want to tell each and every one of you in this room, thank you. I, as your police chief, yes, I'm old enough to be your police chief. I get that question a lot. Um, <laughs> I, as your police chief, am extremely proud and extremely humbled, and I'm inspired and I'm motivated every opportunity I get to talk to a group of volunteers. And here's why. There are things in life we do because we have to, and there are things in life we do because we get to. And I've found that volunteers see life through the get-to lens, not the have-to lens. We have to pay our taxes, we have to go to work, you know, those types of things. 
But those of us that get into community service or get into volunteering, we do it because we think that we can make an impact in, in our community, in somebody's life. It's always for something greater than ourselves, and we do it because we get to do it. So I came here to tell you thank you. Each and every day you show up and you read to kids and you, you volunteer and you help out our community because you believe it's the right thing to do, and you perceive this sense that it's an opportunity that you get to have. And that's really inspiring to, to me and very motivating to me. I'm sitting here looking at Michael, and he's going to talk in a little bit. Um, and I've already read his speech. I was looking to see what I could steal off of it. <laughs> Mike's one of our reserve officers. He volunteers at the police department. He comes and he, he works his tail off for us. And he does that because he has this, this sense that he gets to do that. He gets to help his community, and that's very inspiring to me. Um, he's a 10 if you haven't met him. I love him dearly, and he's just a tremendous asset to our agency and to our community. So you'll get to hear from him in just a minute. So I came here today to tell you thank you. I also want to share a funny story with you. I got to um, read, see, I got to. I got to read to some kids at Ferguson Elementary School. I was asked to do that a couple of uh, a couple weeks ago, about a month ago, I guess. And I don't know how you guys, somebody's got to teach me how to hold the book sideways and read, because I'm terrible at it. And I'm stumbling along, and I'm missing some words, and this cute little six, seven-year-old, she corrects me and tells me the right words. <laughs> And I started laughing, and I said, do you want to read the book? She goes, no, you're doing fine. <laughs> it's like, this is awesome. This is awesome. I used to read to my children all the time. They love to read, and my wife and I thought that was really important. We recognize that people who are literate care about their education, and we've heard that, that, learning, or that uh, reading leads to learning, and learning leads to education, and I want to take that a step further. Education creates people who care about their communities. And that's where I fit in as your chief. People who care about their community have pride in their community. Then we have this rich, beautiful place to live. So continue to read to those kids. Education is really important. But we would read to our kids all the time, and they'd bring us books. And there were times that I didn't feel like I wanted to. And I would, just to be a good dad, and I'd skip pages. And my children would always call me out and tell me when I skipped pages. <laughs> And I recognized one time when Caden was really little, and she's like, Daddy, you, you skipped a page. Oh, I'm sorry, sweetheart. I went back. And I recognized that that was an opportunity that, that was a very blessed opportunity for me. And I shouldn't be skipping pages. I felt really bad about that. Because those are small opportunities to give to, to kids and to give them something greater in life. Um, and they really they admire you for that. And they look up to you for that. And that's just something small that you can give them that they will carry on with forever. Um, so thank you for that. I want to leave you with one last thing. Gandhi said, be the change that you want to see in this world. And I want you to think about that for a moment. And I want to talk a little bit bigger than just reading for a second. As you're driving through Klamath, as you see things that need to be done in this town, I need your help. Do it. You get to change this community. If there's things about our town that you don't like, fix it. I need people like everybody in this room who cares about kids, who cares about our community, who cares about volunteering, who knows we can be better, and who knows to seize those opportunities because we get to do that. If you see something that you don't like, fix it. If you need my help, call me. I'll be here for you. But this room with people who get that, I need your help. We live in an amazing community, so let's support our children. Let's give back. Let's try to think about how we can pay things forward to make plan with great in the years to come. And Alex? You're a part of that, buddy. <laughs> Thank you. A lot of youthful energy that we serve um, in, by serving children, but the Youth Advisory Board this year was just reinvigorated. Um, in Alex's year, they won the Oregon Governor's Award, and I have big dreams for this same group to do it again because of the demonstrable impact they made. I would like um, <clears throat> these young people to come forward to thank them for um, reading, well, these are the actual the youth board leaders. And so, um, Marina Connolly and Hayden Dentinger. Are they, they might all be working in the kitchen. Are they all working in the kitchen? Okay, so we'll set this aside really quick. <clears throat> I did want you to let you know a quick infomercial. Somebody with Subaru keys with a plain silver, they forgot at the front table. Is anybody missing these? Or if you are? Okay. All right, friend, we'll get those to you. This is one of my favorite 
parts of the event where we, I'm going to toss them to John Rodemaker. Thank you, good catch. Where our, our site coordinators stand up, and we would like to have them please stand. If Carly Gilder, my colleague, could come up, we're going to give them their certificates right where they're standing. But um, the site coordinators, and you know and love and appreciate them, they are the people that take care of everything at the school site. They are the ones that do the heavy lifting, that recruit, retain, recognize, and reward our volunteers. They are your face, your boots on the ground that keep you coming back and, and being part of um, our, our family and hopefully having a valuable reading experience. So if you'd like to stand, Carly is going to um, give these to you. And maybe why don't you just come up here? That would be great so everybody could see you. But if you read for this, well, I'm going to do it differently. I'd like to have you stand up depending upon the how many years you've read. So, okay, Jolene Baker. Mike, oh, well, we'll say this happy for all at once, although, Jolene, <laughs> for everybody all at once. Jolene was at Conger Elementary. Mike Banfield from Henley Elementary. Janet Cornell, I think she's not, Janet, okay. Um, Bettina Denny from Keno Elementary. Hayden Dettinger, Roosevelt. Dana Dixon, Malin, is she back there? She's back. Okay, Carly with Klamath Head Start, mm -hmm. and Conger. <laughs> Diane Hasman from Jillikwin, along with Althea Headley from Bonanza. Darlene Long from Keno. Jamie Mangan from Henley. Marilyn Martins from Ferguson. There you go. Bernie, oh, excuse me, Vicki O'Brien, Pelican Elementary. Pat, uh, John Rodemaker. Pat Phillips, are you here? Mary Ann Samard from Stearns. And Sandy Stewart from Chiliquin. Bo Stork, Migrant Head Start. Bo, are you around here, buddy? Cynthia Allray, Mills Elementary School, and Bernie Wood. Thank you. There we go. If you guys would just line up right in front, all the way across here. Yes. These are the people that deliver the program that are there for all of our readers. They do this strictly voluntarily. I don't know if you remember years ago through Amer AmeriCorps, we were able to pay our site coordinators. And now it's a labor of love. Yeah. And these beautiful folks up here dedicate their time, themselves, Cute. their energy and effort to make sure that you as readers have a positive reading experience and feel rewarded by it as well. I would love right now, if you have read for us for a year, would you mind standing up if you've read for one year? If you just read one year. Okay. If you've read for two years, stand up. If you have read for three to five years, please stand up. If you have read for five to say six, seven, eight years, eight to ten years, ten to twelve years, twelve to fifteen years. Oh my goodness. Okay. 17 to 8, 17 to 19 years, 20 years, Mark Kane, I see you sitting there, Honey Ray, 21 years, 22 years, 23 years, 24 years, Mark, Mark Kane, <laughs> and hey, Mark. Stand if you are a friend and fan of our organization, then let's give everyone a hand. Yay. We appreciate you so much. Okay, so this program is terrific. We have something very special. We have someone we are recognizing, and we have 
an author who I am prancing to introduce you to and tell you about. And so at this time, very quickly, we're going to do a three minute clear your plates and give you a piece of cake so that we can listen to these folks um, talk about sweet things and, ha and eat sweet things at the same time. So we're going to have our Henley folks race around and clear your plate so you don't have to lean into your spaghetti and get a piece of cake and then we'll return back. Our youth board and that came in large part because of two very involved people who I am most proud to call my young colleagues who I think are going to be world changers. And so I'm very excited to honor um, some shining stars amongst this youth board who have done great things in recruiting their friends, their colleagues to read at different sites and to grow the program. Today they were late getting here because they just did a book giveaway to six classrooms at Henley Elementary School. I'm very proud of them. If I could bring up Hayden Dettinger and Chelsea Hensley, I would like to give them a shining star. It says, you are truly a smart, a smart star. Thank you for your outstanding leadership and service in helping us shine. So, I have to get a picture of them as well. They are going to then um, introduce their colleagues on this group, and I will turn the program over to them. Hi. <laughs> so, um, as Holly said, the kids on this youth advisory board, I say kids like I'm not one of them, um, have done incredible things for the SMART program this year. We pulled them together kind of last minute. It was right before we did our carnival, and we were hair on fire, and they worked really, really hard for us. They were there as long as anybody else, and it was just super great to see people who we're as committed to this program as everyone else in this room, especially young people. Um, we're gonna go ahead and recognize our Youth Advisory Board members right now. Um, so if you guys can just come up and line up, uh, look really pretty together, you guys are all gorgeous, it'll be great. Um, Kate and Hensley. <laughs> Hayden Lamb. <laughs> Mackenzie Molyneux. Kristen Scott. Bo Stork. Charlotte Waite. And Marina Connolly. The other thing that I'd like to do is recognize the group of kids who read for me um, that are high schoolers on Friday mornings now at Roosevelt. It is a huge time commitment because these kids go to OIT classes from 8 to 10 in the morning. Um, first couple terms it was Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and they took their Tuesdays to come read for SMART. And now the only day they have off in the morning where they don't have to be there from 8 to 10, you know, how late all these high school kids, I just keep saying, um, how late all these kids work at night. I mean, they're there at 8 in the morning every morning, and they're the most faithful readers I have. So if I could have um, Alan, Hunter, Jasmine, and Chelsea all stand up just to be recognized for how hard you guys work. The, uh, one, uh, we changed from Tuesdays to Fridays, and I had to fill in for Hunter, and he reads with a little boy named Trenton. And Hunter here was on a college visit and Trenton read with me, and he was so polite and kind, and then at the end of it, he goes, you're very nice and stuff, but when is Hunter coming back? <laughs> so, so we also, um, I wanted to tell you the epitome of, of smart reading. We have a reader named Mike Druin, and he reads at our Head Start program, our Klamath Family Head Start and a little boy rushed up to him a couple weeks ago and I just happened to be sitting next to him and he poked him in the tummy and he said, hey, I know you, you're here for me all the time. And I thought, isn't that the essence of what we do at SMART, how we suit up and show up and hopefully we are there all the time. So at this point in the evening, I wanted to bring uh, big banners and bells and whistles to honor our volunteer of the year. I hope that you saw the article in Saturday's paper on an extraordinary individual that has 
understood the backbone of how we need to exist and that it requires, again, dollars and cents. And I would like to introduce you to Michael Cordier. Michael, Michael has a crazy contagious energy that people gravitate to. And it is, you just want to be part of his airspace because it is positive, it's forward thinking, it comes from a place of so much good. And I am, could not be more proud to have him as somebody that I lock arms with on extraordinary projects. He thinks big, he thinks outside the box, he thinks uh, responsibly. He's a very good steward um, on behalf of SMART, on behalf of his organization, and we're proud to have him affiliated with SMART, and I want to skywrite it, and I'm very pleased to honor him tonight with this plaque that says, we wish to salute and celebrate Michael Cordonier for your tireless service, remarkable leadership, contagious energy, wonderful work ethic, which makes everyone around you better as we strive to inspire our community's children to be strong readers and leaders. So, thank you so much. We're going to let him turn it over. Wow, um, it's funny how everybody at the table, um, my table specifically, chuckled when she said crazy, because she definitely got that part right. Um, I just can't tell you guys what a great honor it is to be up here in front of you this evening. A month, month or so ago, I had the opportunity to represent SMART for Climate Falls at the Alphabet Ball in Portland <clears throat> and receive a volunteer of the, uh, the year. So my reoccurring thought was up on the podium was how everybody in the SMART program in Klamath Falls should have been up there with me. And I looked at my name and I thought, man, everybody in Klamath, Klamath Falls name should be on this with me, on this award with me. Let's set that there. <clears throat> I can't express how humbling it is to be chosen from a, this group of amazing volunteers. Let's be honest. We wouldn't have this award without everybody here. I personally want to thank, thank all the readers and the site coordinators. Without you, this program would not exist, plain and simple. And that's pretty humbling to me. Um, I'm pretty passionate about this program. And knowing, knowing what you do drives me to raise the money that I do. When I look across the room, <clears throat> I see a group of people that change lives for at-risk children. That reaches hundred years into the future. And some may say, especially at my table, oh Mike, you're such an exaggerator. And that holds true for most things. But in this case, not for what you do. <clears throat> if we look a hundred more years into the future, and uh, picture your grandmother reading their grandpaper, grandbaby on her lap and argued that you may have started when you sat down with a kid and read. And you may have been the only person to sit with a kid and share that love of reading. The only one to share that level of reading with a child who was in a place that did not have anyone else to do that with. Because of them learning to love reading when they became a parent or smart reader that passed on to the next great generation and so on. But it started with everybody here. <clears throat> I can say reading has profoundly changed my life and has opened so many avenues for me to succeed. I feel in America every kid needs that, needs that opportunity. Smart readers provide the opportunity. I'm passionate about Klamath Falls. This town has given me everything I love in life. My beautiful wife, my three kids. I was accepted into OIT after KCC here in Klamath. At, a, a, at OIT, I met a recruiter from Jeldwin and was given an hourly job by continu and, uh, while continuing college. I used that opportunity to become a manager, which helped me support my wife while well, she went away. She attended OIT and soon became a nurse. She now works in ER at the hospital where my babies were born. I mean, if you really think about it, I do all Climate Falls. It makes me uh, passionate to help Climate Falls be a better place. Oddly enough, I bumped into Holly one day, and we were at the library having a conversation about making Climate a better place. Somewhere in the conversation, she said, I know how to make it better. And she asked me to join the Leadership Council for SMART. Once I learned how devoted every person in this room was, and the readers, I knew, where the, I knew it was the right place to focus my efforts to make a difference for Climate because you guys make a difference for climate. Unfortunately, some of the people who helped us raise money are not here tonight, but it would be remiss for me not to mention them tonight. Uh, Darby Sandler from Boyd's, who once I talked to her about it, she reached into her checkbook and wrote out a $1,000 check, even though her company was um, going to do that. 
Um, Kevin Sandro from CPG Marketing, Cormark and Grants Pass with their team, Richard Turner from Kaler Sender, Portland Harbor Wholesale in Washington and Oregon, Tony and Brian from Linco in Illinois, Don Anderson with Old Trapper, Jerky, Jennifer Kent with Nebo Flashlights, Spire, Coke, Monster, Donna with Curtis uh, Restaurant Supply, Jamie and Dustin, the owners of It's Jerky, Ed Sob and Sons, Fast Break of Oregon Inc. and Fast Break LLC are all the corporate sponsors I want to thank for the tremendous financial support over the last three years. We were able to raise thousands and thousands of dollars with the support of these companies. And to show appreciation, I want to dedicate this award to all the readers, site coordinators for our program. Now I'm going to give this award to Holly to keep in the smart office. At this time, I want to introduce my director of operations, Jeff Chase. But before I do, I want to quickly let you know some things about Jeff. In one of our first meetings after he hired me, he got real serious and said, Mike, it's not all about making money. It's about our job to help the community. We have to find ways to help climate. It's just the right thing to do, and it's our duty. We have a huge responsibility to work as hard as we can to make it better here. See, I think other people say that, but Jeff, he actually backs it up. He knows he cannot get out of the office. He's the very backbone of our operation. He's always in the office. But he said, Mike, go volunteer for the both of us. Go make an impact on our town. So because of the opportunity it gives me, I have the chance to really be involved with over 14 local nonprofit organizations, with most of my time and energy being used to raise money for Spark. Smart. So can you give me a big round of uh, give me a big round of applause for Jeff as he comes up to talk to you? As he's the real reason I'm in the position to help Smart. Um, thank you for that introduction. I'm gonna put together a speech and we'll see if I stick with it. But um, really, uh, it's a privilege to be up here. And Michael's right in a way that I don't get out and I don't volunteer. And I do what I can to help support people that do. Um, it's just. I'm stuck in work and I like being there and I don't get out as much as I need to, but overall, Michael is the reason that we're helping contribute to the company, or to the community, and my company helps me do that. Um, about four years ago, I got the opportunity to be in charge of Ed's Fast Break convenience stores, and a lot of you don't know what those are. We only have three in town now, but we are 28 strong overall, spread out throughout Oregon and a little bit in California. Um, so the owners, uh, David Bradstaw, they're really involved in the communities. So they like to help kids and help give back. And they allow me to do that. They give me the trust and they give my team the trust to, to step up and use the money in a way that helps support the community. They don't even question it as long as it's for kids and for the good of the betterment of that. Um, so what happened four years ago, they asked me to take over the company, that part of the company, and I, I stepped up. And my philosophy and what I wanted to do was be successful and um, to make more money, to grow, to get more stores and um, support the community more and a lot of people think we wanted to grow and be so success successful to just for the sake of it to bring more wealth to get more money to owners but that's not the case the owners put the money back in the company we take that we grow the stores we give more jobs we supply benefits to employees and hopefully eventually we'll have better living wages for them above minimum wage but also with that we give back to the communities and we can't give back to the communities if we aren't success successful and continue to grow so about, what, two years ago, two and a half years ago, I'm trying to find people to build this team that have the same visions I have and the same desire to be successful to give back to the community. And it's hard to find. Um, I need to find a, when I was looking for a category manager or a marketing manager or buyer or merchandiser specialist or somebody that could do about five other things, but I only had the resources to hire one person. And, um, was having no luck. So about the fourth time I put out an advertisement for this, I get a response from Michael. So I'm like, okay, I'll interview and see what happens. Is uh, actually that day he came in, I forgot I had an interview. I was a little busy, and I was wearing my normal work attire, which was shorts and a t-shirt, and might have been flip flops that day. I don't know. I was pretty down to earth. And then comes Michael, dressed up in a nice plaid suit and a huge beard. And I was like, man, I, I don't know if this is the right person. I, I just, I'm just not sure. Well, I'll, I'll go through it anyhow. Within a couple minutes in the interview, I'm like, this, this guy has to be part of the team. His energy, his intelligence, uh, he was just exactly what I was looking for. And was it two weeks later he came on? Uh, like 
six months later, I think. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> We're a little slow. So I wanted them two weeks later. Sure, I liked me. And, and it took a while to get them on, but we got them on. Um, and since then, I can't tell you how many times we sit there and just share the visions and the dreams where we want to go with the company. Um, the owners give us that luxury to, to help decide what avenue we're going, what communities we're going to be in, and just how we can give back to the community. At one time, Michael brought the Smart Reader program to me, and I said, that sounds great, go ahead and do it. And he took it and he ran with it, and through our, his tireless efforts and our, his partnerships with the vendors that we have, with the core marks, the <laughs> old trappers, and, and the people that support our business, he's developed the, rate, the relationships, and they've come in and helped out too. And that's just great seeing people in areas that aren't even in our communities coming forth and believing so much with Mike was put forth that they're willing to invest in our community and help us grow. And you know, this could carry on in other communities. We're throughout Oregon, so we really want to start taking forward the message and helping other people. So I do want to take this time to thank my wife, Sherry, my children, Ryan, Brianna, and Luke, for allowing your work as much as you do to be successful. And I want to thank Candy, Emily Cameron, and Carson for sharing Michael with us, because he does spend a lot of time in the office. And even when he's not working, he's thinking about work. We all do. We, we sit there and think about how we can sell more candy bars to help people. Or, you know, is this healthy food set going to work or w whatever on that. So he's never really not working, I think, at, whether it's through my work or his volunteer or the, the reserve. So um, I really want to thank Michael Farray Des for, for not only for Ed's Fast Break, but for the community. And it's a privilege to work with him and have him work with the community. So thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Mike. In fact, one of their vendors, supplier partners, was so excited about the work that they were doing. He came all the way from Illinois to our Boots for Books bash um, this last fall. So that, that speaks um, great things about this wonderful group of folks, and Ed Stobb and Sons and Fast Break as well. So now we are at our, um, our featured speaker tonight, and I, Alex has a very high bar for who he thinks are um, just amazing, inspiring speakers in his coursework. And he's had the privilege to sit at the feet of some really great masters of storytelling and reading and early education. And he called me, was it three or four months ago? And he said, if you don't hang up and call this guy right now, it's gonna be a crime. And so he said, his name is Matt Damon, and I thought he was pimping me, Matt Damon, the movie star. And I said, okay, I'll just get right on that, and I'll, I'll make that call, son. He goes, no, I have his contact information. He just spoke for my class, and people were riveted. And so um, I am so delighted and honored that the generous spirit of Matt Damon, storyteller, author extraordinaire, uh, Fall of General Custard and the Overthrow of a Leftover. I immediately bought it for everyone in our family. It was in everybody's Easter baskets, <laughs> as well as for my brothers and sisters. But he is here to talk to us tonight in a way that connects the dots for reading and learning and literacy. And I'm so honored to introduce to you Matt Damon. Welcome. Thank you, Holly. If I only met Holly tonight, I'd be com completely inspired. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but uh, all the speakers, I, I mean, this is very inspiring stuff, and um, feel the love, you know? I mean, this is, uh, we've got the football coach who loves his players and his, and his work with them, and we've got a police chief that quotes Gandhi, and uh, just so much, I, you know, it's, it's very much in the room. And a vol and volunteer who is vulnerable, vulnerable enough to show his passion for what he does and the support from his work and the people who love him. Uh, it's it's this has been a really great night for me to come and, and uh, hear from all of you. Uh, so let's see here. I am Matt Damon, and uh, I'm the real Matt Damon. I'm older. I had the name first. <laughs> I'm keeping it. Um, so I'm the author of The Fall of General Custard, or The Overthrow of a Leftover, and um, it's a book about a food fight. That's what initially usually draws the kids in. Ooh, food fight. Uh, all the characters are foods, they live in the fridge, and it's a, it's a world in its own. Ultimately, it's a story of friendship, loyalty, peace, 
uh, cooperation, community cooperation, which obviously is a is a theme here for sure. Um, so, a little bit about me. It's always about me, isn't it? <laughs> when, the, when people come to speak. Uh, so, um, my life as a writer started uh, with my life as a reader. And that started where I grew up on the East Coast, Gadna, Mass, not the Worcester. And um, I don't talk like that anymore, but when I get on the phone with my sister, I do. It's weird. Um, it's wicked weird. So um, I came from a big family, six kids, three were adopted, uh, one of my brothers had a, a hearing impairment, um, and so I didn't get a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with my parents. Uh, they were very busy um, with their own lives and with all raising the kids and all that, but um, as I look back, what I see is that they valued reading, and they valued the read aloud. It was a uh, sacred time in our house. Um, not that we weren't laughing and giggling and having fun, but there was a sacredness to it. Um, a time of intimacy, connection, nurturing, humor, questions about people, questions about life, and answers. Through literature, we can learn so much as children, especially when it's real literature that's shared by people we love. Um, so even though there might have been other kids on the couch or on the lap, um, I felt like I had my parents full attention and really saw this act of reading as an act of love. Um, and it's given me a strong belief about bringing books and reading into children's lives. Um, these days I'm a teacher, uh, I'm a parent, um, I taught in the classroom uh, mostly third grade for about 18 years. Now I'm a, li a librarian teacher, so I travel around. The, uh, I'm in the Ashland School District, and I travel to three of the elementary schools and and um, teach the kids about library schools. But also, you know, mostly what I try to do is inspire them, motivate them um, as readers, and show them what's out there and how to find it. Um, so over the years and my experiences and my understanding with regard to the benefits of reading, um, all this has grown. You know, the longer I'm in it, the more I realize the importance of reading, um, not only in children's lives, but in my own lives, sorry, in my own life. Um, so children who become independent readers, and I'm preaching to the choir here, but let's just really think about this. They're more likely to continue improving as readers and branching out into a wider variety of genres and types of reading. So reading breeds reading, and I think that was mentioned earlier. Um, they're more likely to be successful in school. They have better communication skills. They are more likely to have better logical thinking skills. They are more likely to adjust to new experiences due to a similar experience in a story. There's great research that shows that if you've lived through something with a character, if that comes up in your own life, you're more likely to be able to kind of work with that and, and um, know some of, the, some of your options. Um, they have enhanced concentration, memory, and self-discipline. They are likely to experience stress reduction as a result of reading. And um, I can tell you kids are, I think they're more stressed these days. So reading can be a, a relief in that area. They have a greater ability to engage their imagination. They have a greater vocabulary and greater overall confidence due to, due to strong language skills. And what I find interesting is they tend to be, the research shows they tend to be more empathetic. Again, they've lived lives through books and so they can connect with other lives around them and, and feel um, those feelings that uh, literature may have brought up for them and apply them in their lives. Um, that's powerful stuff. And, and again, I'm preaching to the choir. Um, well, anyway, that's the list. But so, my love of reading and, and, and sharing and seeing the benefits have led me to want to write my own book. So, I wrote it. And when I wrote this book, I had several goals. So one is, it's got to be entertaining, right? None of you have ever sat down with one of your readers and um, read a book that didn't in some way entertain, bring joy, bring pleasure. So that's, that's key. That's got to be um, a good book in that way. 
Also, I wanted to write a book that could be shared, that I could imagine a family sharing together or a teacher reading and connecting with the children with that story. I wanted to write a book that, we, that, that could weave in important human themes, friendship, courage, loyalty, cooperation. I didn't necessarily want it to be a didactic book, but I wanted it to be meaningful. Um, and I also like to tell a story that's not true, but has truth in it. Because I think you can pull kids in that way, in the imagination and the fantasy, but, but you weave truth in it. And I love books that rhyme, so it rhymes. Um, and I loved what uh, Alex said. Um, I had to write it down here to add it to my notes, but the real key for me, or one of the real keys, was a children's story that uh, can only be enjoyed by children is not a good story. I so agree with that. If I won't, if I won't hear this story a hundred times and love it every time, I don't want to write it. I want to be able. To, I want adults to be sitting in the room and enjoy it. Uh, so I wrote it um, on many levels. Um, if you get a chance to read it at some point, I think you'll see that and, and hopefully appreciate that about it. It's like that Disney movie where the sort of some jokes just go right over the kid's head, but it's there for the adults. Uh, there's a lot of puns and wordplay in here that the kids can engage in, but um, it's there for the adults as well. So anyway, I want to talk a little more about reading and get off this subject. But let me just share you a taste of it. And um, I think I'll pull an Alex here and walk around. So the book starts in a very orderly fridge. And I think kids like order in their lives. And most good stories start where the world is it's OK. Everything's OK in the world. Um, so this starts, life in the fridge was quite peaceful and cool, while under Queen Honeydew's virtuous rule, the queen led with fairness, she never was cruel, to the richest desserts, nor the poorest thin gruel. The food groups were blessed by her wisdom and grace, and each sort of food had its own proper place. The fruits claimed the top shelf as their special space. The next section down was the vegetable base. The middle shelf held an odd mixture of stuff like pastas and cheeses and small pastry puffs. Below them were the meats, who seemed rowdy and rough, though deep down inside, they were tender, not tough. <laughs> On the bottom shelf sat the desserts and the treats, who were mostly well known to be kind, gentle, sweet. Each shelf was well kept, each was tidy and neat, with all food well sheltered from dryness and heat. Now part of the football team is on their phones, and part of them are watching. <laughs> I need to write a book that can draw the attention of a football team. That would be my <laughs> um, These guys are tough, but probably tender too. That's, uh, that's true of any good man. Anyway, I digress. So then um, an olive and a ch are, uh, the cherries are brought to the olive jar's side. And uh, they, an olive and a cherry come out to play, and they are, uh, they play hide and seek uh, around the fruit salad tray, and they have a good time. And I love when they say, um, uh, what a wonderful welcome surprise. Oh no, Romeo, olive, you're playful and fast, but why are you salty, the sweet cherry asked. I'm stored in a brine, so I'll last. But like you, I grew on a tree in the past. And so they have fun together, but then General Custer appears. He's thrashing his sword around, and he feels like the cherries should have been placed on the dessert shelf, because after all, they're maraschino cherries, and a maraschino cherry is a dessert. So here we have the seeds of conflict. And uh, Custer makes his argument to the queen. Um, Sweet maraschinos, I think you should know, belong on desserts for good taste and good show. So, queen, I demand that you send them below. But if you do not, I'll declare you my foe. <laughs> well, she says, you know, a food's point of view can be a food's point of view. And if they say they're desserts, I say they are too. Or if they say they're fruits, I say they are too. So he gets the, 
He gets the meats and the sweets kind of riled up, you know. <laughs> oh, we must stop this problem right down at its roots, or there'll be a day when all sweets are called fruits. Let's thump that ripe melon and give her the boot. Then I'll be the king, all the food must salute. <laughs> well, anyway, you can see where this is going. He gets a brigade to go food nap the cherries. <laughs> so a bologna brigade with a pie and a prawn snuck up to the fruit section just before dawn. They food nap the cherries with boldness and brawn. When the other fruits woke, the poor cherries were gone. <laughs> so I, I won't read the whole story, but anyway, that's the end of it. And uh, I will read you the beginning of the food fight, though, because this is probably the favorite page of, of a lot of kids, other than the final page. It's also a favorite. But the illustrator, who's, oh, who, by the way, his name, his name is Gideon Kendall, and um, he's in New York City. I've never met him, but we've talked a lot over the phone. This was the first picture he showed us and, uh, or, or drew for us, and we knew we had the right illustrator. So uh, it was Custard's fierce forces that fired food first. A fudge sauce bomb landed loudly and burst. <laughs> Two beets or three beets were bruised badly and had to be nursed. Some pies charged in hard with the large liverwurst. <laughs> Salamis and sausages made in New York tossed the fresh salad with help from the pork. <laughs> the sweet bubbly wine shot her dangerous cork, and chocolate bonbons were launched from a fork. Anyway, that's 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 a taste of the food fight for you, and um, anyway, that that's the kind of story I would have wanted to read. That's the kind of story I would have wanted um, my parents to read to me, and um, I think there's a richness in it uh, with the themes. As you, if you get a chance to read it, um, you'll see there's a richness with the themes that I think um, it goes way it goes beyond just a fun story. I mean, you can really. Uh, talk with kids a lot about a lot of uh, a lot of the human experience. Conflict, cooperation, courage, friendship. So anyway, you and I are believers. We believe in reading. We believe in the power of literature. That's, that's who we are. If you're in this room, that's who you are. And I just want to talk for a few minutes before I close a little bit about why that might be. What, what might we share? Uh, that, that makes us feel this way. Um, so as lifelong readers, we have been shaped and changed by books, and we understand there is a deep power that comes with a great story. You and I want children to know about this power, to literally feel the power. The transformational power of reading runs so deep inside you and I that we would probably have a hard time imagining our lives without its powerful benefits. How many of you believe in the transformational power of video gaming in children's lives? Oh, a few hands in the back, okay. And would you sign up for Smagit? Smart make, or start making a gamer today? Probably not. Not that there's anything horribly wrong with gaming. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fun pastime, it's a great recreation, but I question whether it would fundamentally change someone's life, unless maybe they're a creator of it. If you're a creator of it, then you're, you're, you are part of a creative process. You're not just responding to a stimulus. Um, how many of you believe in the transformational power of television in children's lives? Would you sign up for the SMAFT? Well, as a SMAFT volunteer, start making a viewer today? You wouldn't, right? I hope. Uh, and we don't, we don't see people, volunteers coming into school, sitting down on a couch and, you know, watching, I don't know, reruns of Gilligan's Island and stuff with the kids. Even though Gilligan's Island can be fun to watch, um, there's something that we realize about reading that is extremely meaningful and powerful. You understand in your mind, your heart, your experience, your active relationship with reading yourself, that it is very different from many of the things that we see children today engaging in. For us, it holds extreme value, not assigned to many other things in life. In life. What is it about reading, though, that makes it more valuable than viewing or gaming? Why does it hold this sacred place in the minds of lifelong readers? 
I think a critical reason is because as current scientific research is beginning to show, reading is a creative act, not a reaction to stimulation, as would be the case of viewing or gaming. It is an act of co-creation with the writer, not just a reaction. With perhaps rare exceptions that I don't happen to know of, but I can suspend my belief that they could be there, with perhaps rare exceptions, television and video games um, do not fundamentally change us. In fact, they actually have great power to get us and our children stuck in a mostly passive state or a state that activates the same brain areas that are activated by sugar, cocaine, and other addictive activities or substances. In other words, electronic viewing and gaming are more likely to bring a cycle bring cyclical obsessive behaviors and actually keep a person from growing. Unless you are creating, as I said before, unless you're creating the video game or the television show yourself, you are mostly a passive consumer who is being stimulated to react. But we could never call this a creative act. When you read, you and your brain and heart are actually co-creators with the writer. I, I, re I repeat myself. Um, while reading or sharing a story, the reader or listening listener must create and act out in their mind the imaginary or described world and the story. This is a creative action. Now, the brain research also shows that readers engage in a piece of literature, or readers who do engage in a piece of literature, are actually activating brain areas and parts of the nervous system in the body, as if they, the reader, or in some cases the listener, are in fact are in fact the character in the story, and that they are experiencing what the character experiences, such as smelling the smoke and hearing the crackle of a brush fire. That part of the brain is activated as if it were happening. Or reaching into a cold barrel of water, searching for a lost necklace. What we know about the kind of brain activity that grows out of the creative act or any creative act, is that it literally builds more nerves and neural connections in our brains. Why you and I are so sure in our minds that reading is powerful is because as lifelong readers, reading has actually built and improved our minds. Far more than most experiences we have had in life. And on a very deep level, we get that and we want to share it with children. You know in your mind and therefore in your heart that reading is extremely important, something you value. And therefore you know it is worth any effort that you can make in order to help children to have this valuable gift in their lives. Sharing reading with a child is a gift of love. It is an act of love. And I want to thank all of you in this room for, on countless occasions, sharing that love, giving that love, to the children. Um, in our day and age, it is an even more important and powerful kind of love um, because of all the other things that exist. They're not good or bad, but we know that reading is love and it is good. Um, that felt kind of interesting to say in a church. <laughs> um, but anyway, we thank you so much for your participation. I hope you continue your commitment um, I have a feeling it, it gives to you as much as you it gives to you as much as you are giving to the children and that's the way it should be and that is how community works and how love works. So I thank you all for being here and I'm more than happy to speak with anyone um, about any of this or the book or hear about your experiences. I'll be at a table with my book if I'll have it for sale as, or you just come over and visit. Don't feel pressure like it's I'm there to sell stuff. I like to talk about the book and uh, would love to share it with you. All right, thank you. Thank Holly. We have five books to give away if you'll bring out your raffle tickets. They are our very precious uh, Oregon Reads Aloud hardbacks. They are all by Oregon uh, authors and illustrators. It's a wonderful compilation and we're honored to give five readers, and I'll read the last three digits, 575. Five, and Carly will bring it to you. Five, seven, five. Jolene! Five, seven, nine. Oh, Marianne! Five, five, one. Five, five, one. Five, 
Somebody have five five one? Okay, we're gonna skip to oh Bettina. Five seven zero. Five seven zero? Okay. Let's see, how many do we have left, Carly? <coughs> okay, and we have one more left. Five nine one. <coughs> we have five nine one? Yes. All right, very good. Well, thank you so much. Remember to please, please take your flowers, and I would invite and encourage you to stop by and have the privilege of saying hello to Mr. Matt Damon and checking out his book. I'm, I promise you that it will be a, a wise investment, and it's something that you will want in your family's library and a treasured collection. So do make sure to pay him a visit on your way out. Very quickly, like, speak to you. <coughs> so thank you for my dad for coming and speaking. It was kind of awesome that day, but I was really good at it. Speaking on the, um, quickly, he is going to be one of the dancers for Dancing with the Stars, which is May 12th. Um, the winner of Dancing with the Stars gets $500 donated to whatever charity um, he or she may choose. So he has chosen to donate the $500, if one, to SMART. Um, and then my family, the Hensley family, will, money, will price match that, and so SMART will get $1,000. Um, if, if Dave wins the um, Dancing with the Stars. So to win, to win is the most votes. So everyone needs to vote for him on May 12th for Dancing with the Stars. Yay. So. Heidi Gaither and Carly Gilder, a huge, huge thank you to them. They ran this along with Holly Stork. Um, they don't get as many thank yous as we should give them. They have spent countless, countless, countless hours of running around. Um, I know Heidi was here since 10 a.m. this morning setting up these beautiful tables and flowers and balloons and everything. So, um, huge, can you give them a round of applause for all their hard work?